Okay, so I will uh, give it a start. Uh, as you can see, I just start recording the webinar um, because indeed it will be published on the Covenant of Mayors website shortly after, uh, as all of our uh, webinars are uh, made available on demand to um, to participants and any uh, actually member of the Covenant of Mayors community afterwards. So welcome to this Covenant of Mayors webinar on public transport as a key enabler for carbon neutral and connected cities. My name is Eugenia Mansutti. I work for the European Covenant of Mayors office in Brussels, and I'm here today with my colleague Arianna Merigo, and we are super happy to actually kickstart today a series of five webinars on policy options to reduce emissions from transport, starting really with the topic of public transport. Today with our uh, partners, UATP, the International Union of Public Transport, ECF, the European Cyclist Federation, and IURC, the International Urban and Regional Cooperation Program. And we will also have uh, some great examples from the ground from cities in Europe uh, and abroad. Um, so, uh, as I said, indeed, this webinar is being recorded. You can see the note here at the bottom of the slide. Um, I guess you're all familiar with the functionalities of Teams, but we will uh, really invite you to make use of the chat, write your questions, your comments, during the uh, the webinar, if you have any, we will then take them into Q&A moments uh, during the webinar. So after the first and the second block, you can also in that moment raise your hand using the reaction uh, button there uh, if you want to intervene. Uh, so it's really how you prefer to to join us in the discussion. And uh, you can also keep your camera on if you have a stable connection. Of course, it's nice to to see each other. Um, so going through the agenda, we will start with a scene setter from uh, our colleague Lucy Patterson from UATP on actually the um, climate, the public transport for climate mitigation, sorry, and an outlook on the status of deployment of public fit uh, on electric and hydrogen in Europe and beyond. We will then continue with the first block uh, about how to decarbonize and increase ridership of public transport in cities with examples from uh, Hamburg and Kansas City in the US, and we will have there a first moment for Q&A and discussion. And we will then continue with a second block on safe and accessible first and last mile, how to improve access to public transport with examples um, and uh, actually uh, a point of view from the European Cyclist Federation on how European cities can improve access to public transport for cyclists. And then we will continue with the example of Fortaleza in, uh, in Brazil. And we will have more time again for um, discussion and, and a Q&A at the end. I will start with a very short introduction on the Covenant of Mayors because I have this opportunity actually to have um, many cities uh, joining us today. Uh, so we'll take just a few minutes for a few updates. As many of you may know already, the Covenant of Mayors has adopted a new political commitment just last year uh, through which cities are now engaging to becoming climate neutral in 2050 or before. Uh, reducing their emissions by at least 80% by 2050 and setting milestones to achieve this target. Uh, so that's really the new framework in which uh, Covenant cities are working at the moment. Uh, and one of our key priorities for this year, it's really to support the European Union's Repower EU plan to make the European Union less dependent on fossil fuel imports and to boost local energy production. So our Covenant of Mayors board representing the initiative has been uh, formulating some suggestions to the EU decision makers. And actually we have, we have launched um, just a month ago or a bit less, a big campaign uh, called the Cities Energy Saving Sprint together with the European Commission and the European Committee of the Regions, encouraging cities to taking measures, both short term and medium term um, to save energy, to uh, alleviate energy poverty in their communities and to prepare for the next winter, also boosting the production of renewable energy. So we have a toolkit of emergency saving measures that cities can take with examples uh, from what other cities are already doing. That's been also translated in all European languages. So hopefully it will be a useful resources for those cities um, that want to engage in the campaign. And another one of our priorities is really to support local implementation for climate neutrality. So to support cities to take action uh, and equip them with uh, the tools and information uh, that they need. So that's uh, what we do in our capacity building work in the Covenant. We organize peer learning, um, peer learning, mutual learning visits. Uh, we provide information on funding and financing opportunities. We organize workshops, webinars and other kind of activities and publications. 
also spotlighting through case studies what cities are doing on the ground. Um, and actually, as part of this, uh, this work, and also because it's, I mean, with the new climate neutrality targets, we need an increased effort uh, to becoming climate neutral that covers all the covenant sectors. We have decided to launch this coalition of the building on sustainable transport uh, with all the partners you see uh, listed on the slide, which are those who really have the expertise uh, on the field and that will help us build, uh, sorry, bring the knowledge that they have closer to the covenant community and make it practic practical for cities uh, to move forward on decarbonizing their, their transport sector. And actually transport is already well integrated in the covenant, in the covenant framework. So here I just uh, listed really in a snapshot uh, what cities are doing on transport, looking at the data that they um, that they provide and also the action plans that they have to develop in the covenant. So transport is one of the four key sectors for mitigation, for reducing emissions. But we also have a list, um, a number of indicators in the adaptation pillar, uh, both for vulnerabilities and impacts uh, related to the transport sector. And it's also, transport is also part of the newly integrated pillar on energy poverty, where we have indicators on access to services, percentage of population living more than one kilometer for public transport and others. Uh, and it's also very important because uh, we could see here from data um, published by the Joint Research Center in 2019, that actually the, um, the percentage of uh, greenhouse gas emissions reported by cities when they start their covenant path is 26% uh, of those are coming from the, uh, from the transport sector. And among all the actions that cities decide to implement in the work of the covenant, almost 15% are on transport. That's why uh, we think it's very important actually to support cities in, uh, in this journey. And, uh, and why we have decided to come up with this series of, uh, of webinars, of which this one on public transport is the, the first and others will follow on urban logistics, active mobility, electric mobility, and some sense hiccups integration. And uh, we will, uh, for sure, if you're interested, um, of course, you can check out the Covenant website for um, to know when the next webinars will be, but we will also be happy if you allow us to contact you and uh, let you know when those next appointments will, uh, will take place. Uh, just before entering into the, I mean, the real core of this webinar, I, I wanted to use this opportunity to flag Something else that we have just launched uh, as the Covenant of Mayor's Office, we have opened the call for the next Covenant City in the Spotlight Award, which is basically really the Covenant of Mayor's Annual Awards, um, which uh, re actually recognize uh, remarkable progress made by Covenant signatories. Uh, and it, uh, it provides a, a recognition of their efforts based on both the actions that they're taking, but also the actual uh, progress compared to their, their starting point. So it's really a process which includes uh, both a qualitative and a quantitative analysis performed by the GRC. And uh, we will reward three cities this year, one small city, municipality, below 50,000 inhabitants, a medium one between 50,000 and 250,000, and a big one above 250,000. Uh, so here you can see the, uh, the winners of the last edition, but I really encourage all cities uh, to apply to this uh, to this award um, and the winners will be announced in the European Week of Regions and Cities by the DG Energy Director General. So that was just like something I wanted to slip in in case it's uh, it's of interest of uh, anyone here in the call. And uh, so I think, yes, we can now go to the core of the webinar and uh, the, probably like starting with the, the part that interests you the most. Um, so really going into the uh, the different topics uh, and local examples from the ground. And we will start with uh, uh, Lucy Patterson from UATP uh, to give us an outlook of uh, the deployment of electric and hydrogen public fleet in Europe, but not only. So please, Lucy, the floor is yours. Great. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, like Eugenia already said, I will be giving you a broad overview of some of the topics and uh, basically also answer the question, why should you care about public transport in this context? So uh, just setting the scene of the role of public transport for climate mitigation, let's remember that in terms of short-term goals, we have approximately 90 months to go until 2030. 
which is, of course, the climate goal that we're currently working towards. So uh, we have a goal of reducing emissions by 55% until the year 2030, as compared to 1990. So quite a long ways to go. And uh, of course, beyond that, we're going, uh, since the Commission announced the Green Deal, towards climate neutrality in 2050. And for that, there's still an immense amount of work to be done in the public, uh, in the transport sector, because it's the only sector that since 1990 has not effectively reduced any of its emissions. So quite a lot of work to be done there. And uh, public transport in that regard is quite a big part of the solution. The Commission actually recognises that also in its Green Deal communication, where they do mention that uh, part of the Green Deal is, as a benefit to citizens, offering more public transport and therefore reducing emissions as well. So going on to the actual benefits of public transport, we've had a big campaign on multiple benefits of public transport, but here I picked out the ones that are quite relevant to the climate mitigation side of things. So increasing, first of all, the use of public transport in cities, but also beyond, is important to realise the climate benefits. So we really, really need modal shift first and foremost. Let me just start with that. Up to 2020, we had about 60 billion, almost 60 billion passenger journeys via public transport inside of Europe. So you can imagine how many cars that takes off the road, how many other trips that would otherwise be done in cars that replace it. So quite a lot of saving in terms of energy, but also reducing congestion, liberating more space since public transport vehicles to transport one person from A to B simply takes up a lot less space than other types of vehicles do. So in that terms, it just makes the cities more livable and more bustling. It also has a lot of benefits in terms of uh, cleaner air. You have a lot less localised emission compared to private vehicles. And also large parts of public transport, uh, it's important to keep in mind, have historically already been electrified for quite a long time. So even before we, we were talking about private electrified vehicles, we had electrified trams, we had electric metros. So quite a lot of low emitting modes in the urban context. And generally, we can say that cities with a high share of public and active transport have half of the emissions than if they were dominated by cars. It's quite an efficient mode of public uh, mode of transport generally. So according to the European Energy Agency, public transport by bus is about two times more efficient than by transport by car and rail is even four times as efficient. So to sum it up, there's quite a lot of benefits to it. And on the side of UITP, we also believe that for cities especially that are getting very ambitious in terms of their climate goals. So for example, we're seeing the 112 mission cities that are aiming to be climate neutral by 2030. Public transport will have to be one of the intrinsic parts of their plans to go towards lower and then at one point zero emissions. Last but not least, I also want to mention that public transport does contribute to several of the, of the SDGs. Of course, the one that you see on the slide at the moment, the one on climate action, but there's also a specific part in SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities that does explicitly mention the importance of expanding the public transport network. Some of the challenges that we're seeing for public transport and the topics that we're really looking at at the moment is that on the one side, we need to digitalise the offer to make it more attractive to get people to use more public transport to then realise the climate benefits. But at the same time, we need to expand the offer to make it possible for people to switch because in some bigger cities, we're already very close to the maximum capacities. And then at the same time, well, improving uh, the sector and making more offer, also decarbonising the vehicles that we do have in operation. And that's why I want to shift over to the next part, and that is the deployment of clean buses specifically. So you've already heard from me today that trams and metros are very much electrified already today. So the big part where we've been focusing on decarbonising the sector has really been the bus segment. So we need to really say that uh, we can't just rely on the already present benefits that public transport has in terms of climate, but we need to continuously approve to stay in attractive service, but also to really keep the place that current, 
currently public transport occupies in cities. So let's look at, first of all, the European clean bus market. So there's been a strong push due to initiatives like the Clean Vehicles Directive to go towards different types of clean buses. So it can be different types of fuels and uh, also due to local policy like cities to go beyond the European standards and beyond the European legislation in terms of promoting zero emission buses. So we're seeing lots of cities saying we need to go towards zero emission buses by 2030, 2035. Different goals depending on the cities, and I think we will hear about a couple of them later on. Uh, if we look at the newly registered vehicles in the last two years, we can see that a lot of the registrations are still diesel, but their share has been decreasing progressively. So from 30, uh, 43% to 34% only in the last two years. And we're seeing that there is quite a significant increase in the amount of battery electric buses. So there were close to 22% of current registrations that we have annually and uh, also in terms of other technology technologies that aren't zero emission, we're looking at CNG buses as well. We're looking at the total amounts of battery electric buses in Europe. I think this slide illustrates quite well that this has been one of the major trends that we're looking at. Many cities are opting for battery electric buses. It's currently one of the more affordable options if you're going into the area of zero emission. And it's one of the technologies that many cities have been experimenting with over the last years. So even before you have European obligations like the Clean Vehicles Directive, many cities were trying to go into that direction anyway, either due to local policy, uh, trying to reduce local emissions, etc. So the numbers of them are steadily growing in terms of the total bus stock. You can see here a comparison between 2017 and 2021. So really, you see we've come from close to 1.5,000 to now more than 9,000 across Europe. And uh, that is from talking to the members expected to grow, grow quite significantly in the coming years as well. And going on to the topic of fuel cell hydrogen buses, we have to say that these aren't quite as pleasant yet as electric buses that we are seeing across Europe. This is not uh, total numbers for the entirety of Europe, but for the cities that have participated in the Assure project that UITP was involved in, but it gives a good idea of the tendency that we're talking about. So in 2021, we had 158 vehicles registered, and a lot of them, so the vast majority in the UK, the Netherlands and in Germany. But we're seeing that both for electric buses and also for hydrogen buses, more cities are experimenting with these zero emission technologies due to legislation, but also due to the fact that policy in cities is pushing for it very much. So in terms of hydrogen vehicles in these cities, we've gone from six cities experimenting with it to 11 cities. Many of these projects are still quite at an early stage. And we are seeing overall that the numbers of electric vehicles is quite significantly larger than the one of hydrogen vehicles. One of the reasons for that is that hydrogen is less available in many areas, but hydrogen buses are also extremely expensive currently. So until that changes from what we hear from our members, it's likely that most will still go towards electric buses for getting zero emission mobility. And very lastly, I want to go a bit beyond our European scope that we're looking at today. We've recently gotten these numbers from REN21 published, whereas uh, the electric bus sales have increased by 40% globally in 2021. So not just a European tendency that we're seeing, this is something that is being replicated across the globe currently, and that will no doubt continue in the future as well. That's it for me for a quick scene setter, but if you've got any questions later on, do let me know. Thank you very much, Lucy. And uh, yes, I, I invite everyone to note your questions in the chat or to like note them down on your pad and to ask them in the in the Q&A. Um, thanks a lot for these uh, scene setter, very comprehensive. And we will now go into the first block of our presentations on how to decarbonize and increase public transport ridership in cities, uh, starting with the example of Hamburg. So thank you, Peter Lindler, to, for being with us, and I will uh, give you the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you and to join you in these extremely important discussions. So 
referring to what Lucy um, just said and, and um, the, the figures she presented, I would like now to, to give you an impression on the local situation of a city which has 1.8 million uh, people living here and the entire region of 5 million people. So public transport is uh, a, a very crucial uh, thing for, for the urban mobility. It's the backbone of, of our uh, mobility concept here in, in Hamburg. Um, you see here with this image, uh, with this picture that we are a waterfront city, so there's a lot of things happening on the streets, but also on the waterways. So let's start with the first slide, just to give you a brief introduction into high solutions. We are a public-private partnership um, and we, we have the project de development, project management and funding uh, acquisition uh, is the core business that we uh, are in charge of. And uh, this is e-mobility, but this is also hydrogen and, and connected new mobility such as autonomous drive. Um, what we do is um, conduct projects uh, here all over northern Germany. Uh, with regard to the uh, requirements and, and, and expectations of uh, the funding institutions. And this is mainly the federal government in Berlin, but also European Commission. Next slide, please. If we have a look at the um, uh, at the data or the, the statistics, um, uh, public transport in Hamburg within the city boundaries has a route length of uh, approximately 1,000 kilometers, and this is equivalent to the to the distance from uh, Hamburg to Paris. Just to give you an idea um, of, of that size and, and, and volume. Next slide, please. Um, 600,000 bus passengers a year, not a year, of course, a day, sorry. A day means that we we um, have a lot of transportation services uh, within the entire region and not just within the, the city itself. And um, this is still increasing until uh, this thing happened with, with the pandemic and um, we are now recovering, but uh, we still have 30% less passengers uh, um, compared to the time before COVID uh, arrived. Next slide, please. Um, this is quite important because we have a binding political uh, decision, a directive that in the public transport sector in Hamburg from 2020 onwards on only zero emission buses will be purchased. This means um, we have to consider that we do not buy extra buses, uh, but it's, it's a clear substitution. Uh, but this substitution um, takes a while, of course, as we have um, a high number of buses and the, the lifetime, the, the operation period of a standard of a, a regular bus with conventional technology here in Hamburg is 40 years. So, um, therefore, we... I think we lost the sound. I don't know if it's just me. It's not just me, it's gone. Okay. Maybe we had a technical issue. I'm just checking if Peter is still with us in the call. Not for the moment. Okay, let's give it two minutes and see if he manages to reconnect. I guess he had a technical issue. Yes. Hi, Peter. We lost you for, um, for a minute. Sorry, sorry for this interruption. Um, um, yeah, so so um, the, the whole transition will, will take a while, but um, we, we finish this, we complete this in 2032. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, we we have specific range conditions that we have to consider. Um, 
and the the majority of the the daily bus operations is a, a range uh, in, in, in ranges between 150 and 300 kilometers. I think this is very similar to what you have in your cities. Next slide, please. Um, when it comes to um, in innovative technology, um, we have a clear um, clear rule here that the the basic uh, the basic uh, concept is to have a, a battery bus with with a depot charging, so it's overnight charging, and uh, it's just a strategic option, but it's not very um, obvious at the moment to have opportunity charging uh, within the operation, but um, mainly we have the overnight charging for the electric buses that we have here. We have some uh, pilot distances, pilot routes, uh, where there is uh, opportunity charging, as you can see here in the picture, uh, but um, this is not for reason of infrastructure and for reason of, um, well, the, the cost. Uh, um, we, we didn't decide to do the, the opportunity charging uh, to have this in a, in a um, more extensive way um, as we have the, some kind of backbone, so to say, the overnight charging at the, on the depot. And we now go to um, to fuel cell hybrid and range extender options. I will explain in the following slides. Next, please. Well, okay. The way from the the way the the hydrogen roadmap. I I wouldn't now uh, really explain to you. I think you are familiar with this. Um, but uh, there is a very strong focus here in Hamburg on hydrogen applications. We are one of the leading cities in the important projects of common European interest, which is right now ongoing procedures with the Commission. And um, all kinds of transport and log logistics is um, uh, covered there, but also um, reflecting what does this mean for the public transport system. Next slide, please. With the hydrogen, um, it, it, it is absolutely key that we have uh, uh, conditions here with regard to the, the port of Hamburg where we have electrolysis, so green hydrogen is produced here in the harbour and um, we have uh, different modes of, of transportation via pipeline or uh, via trailer, so we are building up, ramping up a, a hydrogen economy here and one of the most important uh, political targets that uh, that um, exist here in the north of Germany is to have a self-sustainable um, market for for hydrogen uh, by 2035, which means we need all the concepts now, the business models and so on, and we have to provide green energy uh, to produce uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen via electrolysis. And what does that mean for the bus system? Next slide, please. Um, currently, we have uh, already by today 160 electric buses in regular operation. 160 buses that are in daily um, operation, so there is no worry about this. This works, this is no problem. Another 470 e-buses will be purchased within the next years until summer 2025. And um, what is very important is that we have the binding uh, commitment of the federal government in Berlin uh, to take uh, the main cost of this, which is 80% of the extra cost of the alternative drive system. So we have a 80% funding for another 470 e-buses still to come until 2025. Um, the total fleet size here in Hamburg by today, but this is, we, we, we always said we are, there will be an expansion, but then uh, the COVID period uh, arised and this was difficult to give an estimate how this will develop in the post-COVID uh, phase. But um, the total fleet size is, uh, 
1,800 buses. Um, and we have two public transport companies. Uh, they, they operate these buses. And um, with the already existing battery technology, with this lithium ion, um, we have a, a coverage of uh, nearly 40% of the overall service portfolio. Um, with the improved technology in, in, the, in, in the battery sector, which is solid state batteries, they have a higher energy density and they are much more efficient uh, compared to a lithium ion technolo technology. There might be another efficiency of maybe covering 20 to 25 um, percent of the overall service portfolio. So we have two thirds uh, with battery technology, but the non-battery potential referring to range and weight of the vehicles is about one third, so 35 percent, which is mainly fuel cell operation than fuel cell buses. And therefore we have to provide green hydrogen as mentioned before. Um, the reality in the, in the fuel cell sector is very much like Lucy presented the figures. We have a limited number uh, of, of fuel cell buses. The lowest um, level that we ever had at, right at the moment, it's just two buses in operation, but five buses soon to come. So um, this is um, so important to gain the experience. We have uh, a pilot uh, route where, where um, battery uh, versus uh, fuel cell is in, in daily operation. So we test both systems and, and to have more insight in this. And therefore we need, next slide please, um, hydrogen refilling stations, of course, but the, the main concept is that uh, we, as we have a, a scale up uh, with, with fuel cell buses, we have um, refilling options uh, on the depot so that they will not uh, take the service of uh, the public uh, refilling stations. And I think this was it uh, with regards to the time. I think I, you, you just said 10 minutes. It's a very brief introduction on what is happening uh, in Hamburg, just to give you an, uh, an idea on the local footprint that we have. Thank you very much. Next slide is the last one. There you have the contact data. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter. And yes, also for being available to be contacted and sharing your, uh, your details here. I invite everyone to note your questions or to write down in the chat, so, because then we will have some Q&A and we can go deeper into uh, into anything that catched your attention, caught your attention from what uh, Peter presented on the strategy for uh, uh, for clean public transport in in Hamburg. Um, I will now pass on the floor to Ajay Faris from Kansas City, who will take control of the presentation, and you can change your slides yourself unless you want me to. Super, it's working. All right, I think I can do it. Um, yes. Good morning uh, or afternoon or evening. Uh, my name is AJ Ferris. I'm the planning manager in Kansas City, Missouri in the United States. Uh, just for some geographical reference, if you were to place your finger on a map of the United States and try to get it right in the middle, uh, you probably uh, your finger would probably land on us. We're about as far away from an ocean as possible. So a very different situation from uh, my colleague in Hamburg, in Hamburg that just uh, presented. But uh, today I'll be talking to you about uh, our uh, foray into uh, our zero emissions program and our uh, experimentation with zero fare public transportation. So uh, currently today uh, our bus fleet is a little bit smaller than my colleague that presented a little bit earlier. We have uh, about uh, 230 buses with 60% of those being uh, compressed natural gas buses. Uh, we have uh, large buses, our bus rapid transit buses, small buses, and our mini buses, uh, which are all used for uh, you know different public transportation services uh, throughout our region. Um, and uh, just to give you an idea of our region, the Kansas City metropolitan area has a population of about 1.7 million. Um, our agency at uh, the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority has 600 employees with half of those being drivers, so about 300 um, 
public transportation operators. Uh, we operate about 40 different routes. Uh, five of those are flexible routes, our flex services. I'd be happy to talk about those more um, if people have questions about those flex uh, or flexible services. We have three uh, bus rapid transit, or uh, as we call them, fast and frequent routes that have um, headways of 10 to 15 minutes. So you'd be, uh, anytime you go to a bus stop, you would only have to wait 10 or 15 minutes to uh, get the bus. Um, we serve about, in, in May, we serviced about 80 or 840,000 trips in the month of May, uh, which was an average uh, of about 34,000 trips made per day. Um, and this was about a 10% increase from May of 2021, which is showing good ridership recovery from the uh, dip that we took in the pandemic. Uh, so now I'll get back. Figured I should probably give you guys a little bit more context about the, our transit agency first, but back to our bus fleet. Uh, so we're just kind of at the very beginning of our um, journey into, uh, you know, getting kind of getting rid of our diesel buses. You can see that we've done a pretty good job of transitioning the majority of our fleet to compressed natural gas buses, but we are now uh, really focusing on moving towards the electric buses, which uh, are battery electric buses, which right now we have uh, seven of. Um, so in our studies and in our journey, you know, uh, probably a lot of you know a lot of this information already, but at least um, for us, it's a higher capital cost than diesel or compressed natural gases to get battery electric buses, which provides some issue. Um, the other issue is these battery electric buses have uh, much less range than diesel or compressed natural gases. Um, and as you might be aware, one of the struggles with many, many American cities, especially in our area, is when they were planned and developed, uh, the availability of land really um, dissuaded urban density. And so our bus routes are very long and we are very spread out. So a lot of the times, one of the biggest challenges we have is how do we keep the battery electric buses out there for a um, long amount of time without having to take them out and either do out on the uh, in the field charging or bring them back to do the bus depot charging. Um, the great part about them is they are lower emissions uh, than diesel and compressed natural gas. Uh, but one of the things we found is there is no immediate direct financial benefits that we have seen so far. The, uh, as my next slide will show, there are uh, potentials in the future. Um, but some of the things that we've uh, identified why we're planning on transitioning to a zero emissions fleet is uh, a much better customer experience. Uh, our zero, zero emission buses have offered smoother, quieter, and more quality rides to our passengers. Um, they're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, which is fantastic. And our uh, operating one battery electric bus we found for our agency will reduce our energy consumption equivalent to 234 barrels of oil per year. So that, that's an amazing stat that's kind of one of our biggest uh, pushing points as we move forward towards a zero emission uh, vehicle fleet. Uh, and we've identified that even though there's not immediate financial benefits that we've seen so far, uh, we are seeing that we'll probably be paying less on energy uh, over fuel moving forward. Um, you can kind of see the money breakdown uh, there, but one of the things that we really enjoy is uh, the price stability of energy is a little bit better right now. Um, we do have some part of our fleets that have to fill up out on the road as it is right now, and uh, with gas prices and oil prices the way they are right now, it's making us take a really, really big hit financially. So the price stability of our battery of battery electric buses um, and any zero emission vehicles is uh, is a big benefit that we've seen. Uh, as of right now, we have uh, two Gillig full size electric vehicles, uh, with uh, and that are basically out in passenger operation today. While we're also doing uh, data monitoring to see how they do. Um, we live in a decently uh, hilly area with a lot of uh, topographic changes. And so there's a lot of data mining going on, looking at how they do on different routes, um, like how, they, how the range is on hill, routes that have a lot of hills based on routes that have a lot of flat area. Uh, and then we have three more on order for 2023 and plan to have a total of about uh, 20 more by 2025. Uh, 
so this is kind of um, the results of the public engagement that we've done. Uh, we're we're very big on including the public in their public transportation uh, system because at the end of the day, uh, our primary goal is connecting the public to opportunities. And at the end of the day, this is their system. So uh, they have, uh, as far as noise goes, noise and vibration and acceleration and deceleration, everything, these battery electric vehicles handle much better and are on just a much better ride um, overall and made for a really pleasant uh, public transportation experience uh, for our customers. So one of the reasons that we're moving forward to um, increasing our zero emission vehicle fleet is uh, we've introduced a uh, electric vehicle policy um, with a full uh, zero emission bus transition goal uh, still being determined. Uh, we're working with our city uh, and that study is currently ongoing to kind of determine that uh, goal year for us to be fully transitioned. Our um, regional metropolitan planning organization, uh, the Mid-America Regional Council, has uh, released a regional climate action plan that we were a sponsor for and we fully endorsed. Uh, in that plan, it also included us going and moving towards zero emission buses. And then our city uh, introduced the Kansas City, um, KC, uh, short for Kansas City Climate Protection and Resiliency Plan for uh, carbon neutrality citywide by 2040, which we have also sponsored um, and had a big part in. So our short term goals uh, is to finish developing that zero emission transition plan to finally get that goal year. Um, and then in the interim, uh, we're looking to acquire 25 uh, more zero emission buses in the next five years, uh, continue performance evaluation and reporting. It's incredibly important for us uh, to really know how these buses work um, and you know what we can get out of them and expand more uh, you know, private and public partnerships. Um, that last bullet point, develop workforce training and facility plan, is one of our biggest challenges that we're facing right now. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to find mechanics uh, to work on these battery electric buses. It's a very um, niche field that we're seeing. It's, it's much easier to find a mechanic to work on a diesel bus. Um, for more information uh, on the zero emission buses, uh, this is a, uh, one of my colleagues here that's kind of leading our effort, but in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to move towards our zero fare uh, thing, which was the other thing that we were wanting to talk about. Am I doing OK on time? OK, um, zero fare was uh, one of the most exciting things that we uh, started. We started doing it March 18th, 2020. Um, the mission of the Kansas City Area, Tra Area Transportation Authority is to connect people to housing, health care, um, education and employment opportunities. And we just didn't feel that we were doing uh, a good job of that. And one of the things that we could do uh, was take away the barrier that FAIR causes for um, some people that are, have a, a more disadvantaged situation. So uh, we implemented this in March 18th of 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, to uh, kind of give people uh, a little bit of a, a rest and uh, there was you know an economic downturn in that part and so that dollar 50 that they were putting in our fare box was able to go back into our economy and they were able to use it for groceries or any other service that they would need uh, we had a net amount of lost fare revenue was between 8 million and 10 million us dollars and you know i believe 10 million us dollars is close to like 9.5 million euro um, and so this uh, loss in our revenue was replaced by funding through the Federal CARES Act, which was essentially a kind of COVID relief uh, focused on public transportation. Uh, when compared to other peer metro transportation systems in our area, uh, our ridership decrease was much less than others. Uh, so we lost way less riders during the pandemic than our peer agencies and we recovered much more quickly during the pandemic. So we we started trending back upwards uh, far before our other agencies. Um, and most of this is, uh, there's a large uh, correlation between uh, that and us moving to zero fare. Uh, the other things was our security incidents declined by 39%. Uh, 
um, and incidents per 100,000 riders declined by 17%. Taking away the fare uh, basically took away a lot of the security incidents that we would have. Um, and finally, uh, basically zero fare, um, we uh, our metropolitan planning organization uh, is estimating that it will result in an annual reduction of about 7,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions due to just getting more people on public transportation. So the last slide that I have is just kind of showing you we are the blue line, the thick blue line at the very top, and this just kind of shows you our uh, dip that we experienced from COVID and how much faster we recovered uh, than our peer transit agencies that are all the other lines below that top thick blue line. So that just gives you a bit of an idea that we didn't fall as much as others and uh, we began our increase back up to 100% of pre-pandemic service and ridership faster than as others as well. But that is all that I have for you all. Thank you so much. It was uh, incredibly exciting to be able to talk to all of you and be able to connect uh, with people from all other countries. It's uh, honestly an honor, so thank you. Thanks a lot Thanks to you, lot. Ajay, for, uh, yeah, for your enthusiasm and for sharing uh, what you're doing in Kansas City. And now we have uh, about 10 minutes for uh, some discussion and questions. Uh, so I, I invite everyone to raise your hand or use the chat and you can ask any questions to, uh, to Peter, to Ajay or to Lucy uh, now. And I will give the floor to Arianna to kickstart the discussion. Yes, uh, while the audience warms, warms, warms up, <laughs> um, feel, feel free to write uh, in the chat or raise your hand, as uh, Eugenia said. Um, I, I wanted to maybe start with, uh, with a question for uh, our last speaker, AJ. You mentioned these uh, flex flexible services. Uh, can you uh, tell us a bit more of how that works? Yeah, so... Um... I think most people here know what a traditional fixed route service is. Uh, a bus goes along the same line uh, over and over again, and the route doesn't change. It has the same route every day. Um, our flexible services, think of them more as a an Uber. Uh, so there is a zone that this uh, service operates in. A person uses our app to schedule, uh, and it's same day scheduling. Um, schedule a ride where they want to be picked up and where they want to be taken then our uh then our uh small bus will go and pick them up and take it to them oftentimes they'll be riding with other people the bus will pick up other people as they go and take them within the zone uh, these flexible services were implemented um, because as i said earlier there's a lot of area to cover and it just can't all be covered uh, efficiently by fixed route transit but that doesn't mean there's not still people in those areas that don't need public transportation. And so flexible routes are our solution to uh, kind of to that issue of urban sprawl and not being able to provide good fixed route, uh, which kind of depends on urban density. Thanks a lot. Uh, Peter, uh, you have raised your hand. Do you want to ask a question? No, not to ask the question, just make a remark on, on what just has been said. Yeah, we also have, we provide these flexible services. Uh, it's what we call ride sharing or ride hailing, which is a small size of bus, uh, 500 cars uh, all around the, the city, and they take, pick you up wherever you are. So there is no special uh, destination where they come, they pick you up everywhere. And um, there is no fixed schedule, but um, so it's very flexi flexible. Uh, mm -hmm. especially with the outer regions, with not in the mm -hmm. city, but in Absolutely. the centralized. Yep. So it's also in, on demand, also in Hamburg. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and what we're seeing is it's actually our fastest growing um, ridership right now. People are really, really kind of gravitating to it. And so we put a lot more um, investment in our uh, technology and scheduling softwares for those uh, for those services. Great, thanks. Uh, there is a question in the chat uh, for uh, Peter. Um, what is the reasonable price for uh, hydrogen in order to uh, assume the overcost of the buses? Hard question, I, I assume. So it, 
the question is the cost of hydrogen, not the cost of the bus. Yeah, did I get it right? The, the cost uh, of Mi Miguel, do you want to specify? Um, yes, I, I assume it's the cost of the hydrogen. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, um, in the public accessible refilling stations, you you pay uh, nine, nine euro fifty for the uh, kilogram uh, hydrogen, um, but of course the, it's it's a little bit cheaper for the uh, public uh, so public transport companies. So it's between seven and eight euros per kilogram. Miguel, does this answer your question, or do you want to? Uh, ask yourself to dig more into it. Thanks. OK, it seems it answered the question. Um, and then for Ajay, uh, what was the increase of users uh, uh, thanks to the Zero Fare program? Yeah, so uh, it was it was kind of hard to study at first because it was implemented during a large trending decrease in ridership due to the pandemic but uh through like going back and looking at ridership from where we were in 2020 and where we are now since implementing zero fare uh we've increased our ridership by over 21 percent um some of that is due to people returning to the buses as they feel more safe um after you know they've been vaccinated and they're they're feeling a little bit more comfortable getting back in crowds and being closer to people uh but a due to our um, from some of the surveys that we've done and some of the educational studies that we've performed to analyze zero fare uh, a large majority of those are coming back uh and a large amount of specific choice riders not transit dependent riders but transit choice riders are uh, coming back due to zero fare and can I ask you if this uh, zero fare program was done based on the income, like uh, people with uh, less income have the possibility to use it and other people don't, or is for everybody? Everyone. We just Everyone. Uh, we just made all bus. So other than our federally required paratransit services, uh, our entire system is zero fare. OK, thanks a lot. Um, any any other questions from the audience? Uh, otherwise, I have one more. Um, Lucy, please. Hi, I uh, just wanted to react on this question of bringing back passengers to public transport because this has obviously been a big topic for us as well uh, in terms of the OATP. We've done a win back passengers campaign and actually talked to a lot of public transport operators and authorities to see which measures worked and we've sort of established a ranking in case that's interesting. So we saw that a big part of it is actually accelerating the digitalization of public transport. So simply knowing when the next bus or train or tram is coming is apparently quite helpful already. Uh, another thing uh, obviously closely related to the pandemic is cleaning services. So this is less about actual cleanliness, uh, but more about perceived security of people in the vehicles. So having visible cleaning routines uh, seem to work quite well to reestablish trust. So seeing people disinfect uh, a place where you would usually put your hand is uh, working quite well as well. And then also simply communicating to passengers because we've seen that in a couple of different countries. There was actually communication about, you know, be really careful in public transport, uh, sort of uh, public transport as a place where to spread the virus. But we've actually not seen studies that have uh, proven that. And this was something that we had to communicate from the sides of the public transport operators quite significantly to say, we're doing a lot, uh, we're taking a lot of measures, people are wearing masks, etc. So the communication part has proven to be quite effective. I think price incentives were ranked at about number six, possibly. Great, thanks a lot, Lucy. Uh, Peter, you wanted to react? No, not to react, but just to, to suggest that maybe uh, a webinar, a separate webinar on on-demand services would be uh, worth to to um, to undertake. Um, as all these these services, these on-demand services, um, they now uh, rise in the uh, cities, and this is uh, an emerging market, not just 
car conventional car sharing, but also this kind of on demand ride sharing uh, services. And um, not to forget the, the classical uh, taxi services. The, the, we we have electrified 180 taxis here in Hamburg, and we end of this year this will be 400 electric uh, taxis in in Hamburg, which is the highest number in Europe. And um, they they also of course they compete with all these new kinds of services, but. Uh, we should uh, have a, a multiple uh, offer to to customers um, here within the city. So we really would appreciate if there is a chance to discuss all this on demand uh, mm -hmm. thing uh, at some other time. But would be nice. Absolutely. Point taken. We can uh, include it in a, a, maybe not in the Covenant of Major series, but uh, for sure in other Eurocities uh, uh, webinars. Absolutely. Um, there are a couple of more questions in the chat. I would ask uh, one is for a J and one is for Peter. Uh, I don't know if you want to reply to those uh, directly in the chat uh, because we uh, should move on with the with the rest of the panel discussion and if we have time, maybe we can come back to it uh, at the end. Uh, so back to you, Eugenia. Yes, yes, sounds great. We will have another 15 minutes at the end in case uh, there are other burning questions. Uh, and we will now move on to the second block of this webinar about safe and accessible first and last mile, how to improve access to public transport. And we will start with Olger Hobold. Uh, I don't know if I pronounce your surname correctly from the European Cyclist Federation. Uh, thank you for being with us. I will, uh, Give you the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Virginia. Uh, I should pronounce it uh, perfectly. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Olga Haubert. I'm the Director of Intellectual Property and Data Collection at the European Cyclist Federation. And today I want to give you a short overview uh, of what is happening in, in Europe on the combination between cycling and public transport. Um, because yeah, we think that's uh, that's a very important combination, uh, both walking and cycling and public transport, uh, because only uh, together can these modes create really uh, sustainable mobility chains that can also uh, replace car travel. And I think uh, uh, that's one of our common goals. Um, yeah, so I will give you a short introduction to ECF. Um, then I will uh, go a bit more into detail into uh, one topic that we've been working on a lot during uh, uh, the last years, which is taking bikes on trains. So the EU rail passenger rights regulation um, and a little report that we did last year on uh, taking bicycles on trains. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a topic that's mostly interesting also for uh, for longer trips, for touristic trips. Um, but then, of course, also for um, short trips for for commuting, uh, it's also important to have bicycle parking and bike sharing at stations. So I will give some some good examples for uh, of that from from across Europe, um, and then conclude. Uh, so uh, as a short introduction um, from our organization, ECF is the European Umbrella Federation. Um, of member-based civil society organizations, and we're advocating and working for more and better cycling. Um, we have more than 60 member organizations from over 14 countries, so we uh, really represent uh, the power of the European cycling movements uh, from a civil society perspective. And yeah, we're based uh, in Brussels, um, working mainly in Europe, uh, but we also try to see the challenges that we face uh, around the globe. Um, yeah, so those are our main goals. More cycling, uh, increase cycling levels in Europe by at least 50%. Um, and I think here also we need to see the combination with other modes like public transport because only together can we really achieve these, these big increases uh, for both modes. Uh, safer cycling, of course, stronger political support, and then also uh, higher investments in cycling. Um, then uh, how do we do that? Yeah, we do uh, evidence-based advocacy. Um, uh, we also do uh, in certain areas some research. Uh, so for example, on the report I will present later on taking bicycles on trains. Um, then uh, we uh, yeah, 
also provide tools, resources and trainings. We coordinate uh, Eurovelo, uh, the European Cycle Route Network, and we organize Velocity, uh, which is the biggest international conference uh, on cycling. So we just had our edition in Ljubljana and uh, we will go to Leipzig next year from 9 to 12 uh, May. You're already invited to that. So uh, now to go into into a topic uh, first, uh, the issue of taking bicycles on trains. Um, so there has been uh, quite some improvement in the EU rail passenger rights regulation, which before only had uh, non-binding language on taking bicycle on trains. And uh, after uh, some years of, of campaigning, um, we're very happy that uh, now the wording is a bit more binding and uh, uh, there's a bit more of, uh, of an obligation uh, for railway companies to provide dedicated space for bicycles on trains. Um, and that as a general rule, at least four spaces uh, on each train and member states can set this number higher if there's a greater demand. Um, and then uh, this will also uh, mean that um, new rolling stock uh, or major upgrades of existing rolling stocks of uh, uh, train coaches, um, for example, um, will have to fulfill these uh, uh, requirements. Um, there might be uh, some restrictions to the use uh, uh, of this right to, to take bicycles on trains, uh, in particular as a result of capacity limits uh, during peak hours. And then that's where the second solution comes in place, uh, also on um, parking and bike sharing at stations uh, for, for commuting and for peak hours. Um, yeah, and then there's some uh, other regulations re uh, relating to passenger rights, uh, for example, on, on information uh, and on uh, uh, rerouting or reimbursement if there's, a, if there's an issue, if there's a problem with the train connection. Um, so that's uh, what will happen in the in the future, thanks to this new uh, uh, regulation. Um, what is the situation now? So we've looked at that uh, last year uh, in our report, Cyclists Love Trains. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's how it looks like. Um, so what we did there was to analyze uh, the bicycle friendliness of uh, European railway operators. Um, focusing on long distance types of trains, because as I said, uh, that's what we very mainly see the uh, uh, the focus um, of this, yeah, of taking bicycles on trains also for, for touristic trips uh, and for making yeah these long distance uh, uh, journeys. Um, and yeah, uh, of course it should be for uh, non dismantled bikes and not only for, for folding bikes, which are basically like a like a hand luggage. Um, so uh, just very briefly, that's uh, how we uh, judged basically the, the the railway operators on these points. So uh, both on the hardware, so of course, most importantly, the, the bicycle spaces on trains, uh, but also the presence of bicycle hire schemes. Uh, and then also uh, what we call the, the software, so uh, all the uh, reservation uh, in which languages uh, websites are available, um, which booking channels are available for, for bicycle tickets. Um, so yeah, these were the, the criteria. Um, we found uh, uh, our top five using this criteria. Um, as you see there, uh, yeah, uh, mainly in, yeah, let's say Central Europe uh, as a, as a bigger region, so uh, Switzerland, uh, Germany, then also Benelux, uh, and then also Hungary um, as the, uh, the winners of this. Uh. But then there are also some uh, companies that uh, automatically got zero points because they don't carry bicycles at all. Um, you can see them here. It's mainly um, yeah, also high speed operators uh, where we see uh, a lot of uh, room for improvement. Um, but there's also already something happening there. So for example, um, Eurostar uh, had announced plans to reintroduce bicycle carriage again, uh, or also uh, Deutsche Bahn uh, with their ICE uh, in the newer uh, in the newer versions of this train, uh, they explicitly foresee bicycle carriage again. So uh, that's a, that's a positive development. Um, so yeah, uh, that's kind of a summary of the of the report. Uh, so 22% of uh, rally undertakings uh, still do not bicycles whatsoever. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there are also some others which have a lot of room for uh, improvement. 
so yeah, that's those are our recommendations. So uh, to accept bicycles on all train services, um, to also install bicycle sharing schemes uh, at the stations, um, then also ticketing. Uh, we are not asking for for free bicycle carriage, but uh, it should be cost effective, and then also the the booking system should be uh, easy to use. Um, and then there should also be uh, clear and concise information on bicycle carriage, um, so easy to find and uh, easy to use in a, in a flexible manner. Um, the next point, uh, so yeah, more for let's say uh, mass transit, uh, bicycle parking and uh, bike sharing at stations. Uh, and here I will present some uh, some examples from around Europe uh, of what is happening at the moment or what is already uh, there. Um, maybe let's start with uh, uh, yeah the best uh, practice example uh, as often in the world of cycling on um, the Netherlands um, where this is really something something really mainstream. Um, so there have been some uh, uh, studies done and um, uh, in the period, I think the latest period where I could find figures was from 2015 to 2017, 46% uh, of passengers cycle to the train station. Um, so this is really uh, uh, yeah, a huge uh, percentage and um, so that explains also why it's uh, a no brainer basically for uh, public authorities and for, for the LA company to, uh, to invest in this. Um, and then yeah, in the Netherlands, uh, maybe you've been there already or you've seen it. Uh, Especially in the last years, they've invested in huge secured parking facilities at stations. Um, so this example is from, from Rotterdam, one of the cities in our cities and regions for cyclist network. Um, so you have a big underground parking uh, for bicycles where you can uh, just cycle in. Uh, so these escalators actually like uh, uh, um, escalators that you can cycle on. Uh, and then uh, you can just bike your, uh, your park your bike uh, very conveniently. In the Netherlands, there's also a big system uh, of bike sharing that's integrated with public transport called OV Feeds, uh, with uh, almost 22,000 bikes in the whole country uh, at railway stations. Um, and this system has really grown a lot uh, in the last years. Uh, so from 1.5 million rides in 2014 to 5.2 million in 2019. Uh, of course, there was a drop uh, during the pandemic, but still you can see that even in 2020 there were more rides than, than in 2014 uh, with the system. Um, yeah, and it's I think very well integrated, so you can use your uh, uh, um, public transport card also for for this system. Um, and they also made a survey uh, and found that 50% of the users uh, use the train more often because of this uh, bike sharing system. So you see that uh, it's actually mutually reinforcing to have uh, uh, this combination of uh, of bike sharing and uh, and the train. Um, then uh, next we go to to Belgium, which is kind of following in the in the footsteps a little bit. Um, so. Uh, that's uh, in Brussels, um, where there have been a lot of efforts uh, on cycling policy in general during the last years, uh, but also on uh, combining uh, cycling and public transport. Um, so uh, at many uh, main train and metro stations in Brussels, you know, have the, these, uh, yeah, let's say uh, uh, full service points for, for bicycles. Uh, so you have secure parking. Um, for example, at the uh, central metro stations uh, uh, in the city center that you can use with your public transport card. Uh, and it's that I managed uh, for through a central system. Uh, you have also a bike sharing system, kind of like the Dutch system over feeds, which is called Blue Bike, uh, which is also linked to, to the railway stations. And then you have repair services also uh, at these stations uh, called Point Velo. And uh, this was, for example, partially financed through uh, EU regional funds. Um, in Germany, uh, so uh, yeah, I have to say maybe um, being German myself, we're a little bit behind, but uh, there are some initiatives happening as well. Um, so uh, there was a study done uh, which identified a need for 1.5 million bike parking places at stations, so that's a huge number. Um, I think what they saw as a baseline now is around 500,000, uh, so they need to kind of quadruple this number um, to, to meet the demand. Uh, so far, um, there are mostly local initiatives. For example, the city of Munich uh, has uh, uh, quite a lot of bike and ride uh, stations at both the train stations, metro, and uh, the uh, yeah, uh, 
commuter train stations. Um, and then Berlin uh, has started an initiative, uh, which is kind of a collaboration between uh, the public transport operator of the city uh, and then a lot of private uh, shared mobility operators. So it's not only for, for cycling, here you can see the, the shared bikes, but it's for example also shared uh, shared scooters or uh, shared cars, and uh, it's called Yelby. So you have like mobility points at important public transport stations where you can rent a bike or a car or, or a scooter. And then there's also uh, more coordination at the national level starting. Um, so a uh, new online platform managed by uh, Deutsche Bahn, the, the weather operator, uh, to share expertise and best practices on bicycle parking at stations. And uh, just this week, there was actually the first national conference on bicycle parking at stations with participation of the uh, federal transport minister. So it shows that this uh, topic is really, really high on the, the agenda in, in Germany now that uh, they're kind of waking up as well. Um, yeah. Then, so, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Hunger. Yeah. You will have to speed up a little bit yes. in this. Uh, yeah, yeah, the last I'm, examples because yeah, yeah but it's super I'm interesting. We can go back uh, to that if there is more. Time. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming uh, to Thank close you. now. Uh, so uh, just going to to Spain now, um, where there is some local initiatives as well. Uh, for example, here in in Catalonia. Um, so this was uh, also part of a EU project called BTB, so uh, bike train bike. Um, and uh, uh, so this, the aim of this project was also to bring together the different actors uh, to, to make a more efficient collaboration. So in this case, the municipalities, uh, the metropolitan area, public transport operators and the private bike shop to provide secure bike parking at the uh, rapid transit station, uh, as well as a fleet of, uh, of shared bicycles. And uh, final example, um, now from uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Slovakia. Um, where, uh, in terms of what is uh, uh, what is there, they they have a system of uh, uh, bike transport on on buses uh, in between the city center of uh, Bratislava and touristic locations. Um, but they're foreseeing to do much much more. So, in the national recovery and resilience plan uh, that had been decided now after after the pandemic, uh, they foresee uh, 100 million euros of investments in cycling, including for the construction of about 5,000 secure parking shelters uh, for bicycles at railway stations, uh, exactly to improve this connection between cycling and uh, and public transport. Um, yeah. So those were really examples. Um, so yeah, just a quick conclusion. Uh, I think really uh, also this last example shows that the time is now uh, to give a boost to the sustainable mobility chain uh, and uh, uh, to improve this combination between cycling and public transport, uh, because really it can offer an alternative to, uh, to the car, uh, which is becoming more and more acute. Uh, in terms of rising energy prices, uh, uh, also in terms of this new kind of uh, uh, oil and fuel crisis that we're having uh, in phase of the climate emergency. Um, so yeah, I think uh, uh, it's time to invest now. So thank you for listening and happy to answer questions later. Thanks a lot, Olga, also for the final call to indeed, I mean, use more active mobility also to tackle the, the energy crisis. Um, I will take back control of the presentation, just to then give the floor to Thais. Um, so Thais is going to speak about bus bike integration in Fortaleza and uh, using public transport as a catalyst to also fight social inequalities and spatial segregation. So I will leave you share your screen. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. So see the presentation? I'm oh, sorry. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much to the space to be here and to discuss this. Um, I'm talking a little bit about the bicycle and public transportation integration in Fortaleza, Brazil. Um, just to give you a little of a geographical uh, situation of Fortaleza, we are in the northeast coast of Brazil. We have 2.6 million inhabitants. We are the fifth city in Brazil. Also, we are the most dense city in Brazil, and we have a vehicle fleet of 1.1 million vehicles and a road network of uh, 4,000 kilometers. Uh, one thing that is important, I think, to say is I, I was part of a mobility lab, and we used to think about initiatives that could uh, change behavior and start uh, first in pilot projects to then be scale up 
in the city. So now I'm in an innovation lab at, uh, working with other offices in the city, but we used to be uh, essentially a mobility lab. Um, to give also uh, a little bit of context, I think it is important to say that uh, in Fortaleza, the electrification process is of our vehicle fleet is still beginning. Uh, also, in cases uh, like Brazil, Fortaleza is a poor city in, in Brazil, taking the context also in Brazil. So I think where our needs here meet uh, for so different context, context is in the accessibility of the people to take people in far distance in the city. So I think this uh, challenge where they meet also because we are still uh, well, so so much in the beginning of this uh, electrification and also other uh, low in emissions initiatives. Uh, but historically, Fortaleza has a car was a car oriented city prioritizing vehicle flow. I, I like to say it, this this was because we are starting to change that uh, we we have 2.4 inhabitants to each motor vehicle, but almost of half of our population commits daily by public transportation in Fortaleza. A uh, large part of, it, of this uh, are dependent to this mode. They don't have alternative because they, they need to go from uh, really far uh, points to the center of the city. Uh, this is a map of Fortaleza. And, and despite of this great coverage that we have of, of our public transportation, this these black spots, they are uh, bus stops in the city. In this gray area, most of it are like natural areas in the city, rivers, uh, green areas. So uh, mo uh, most of our roads, our, our city roads are connected to our bus transportation system, but we still have many challenges because we operate over capacity. People need to do a lot of integration, uh, bus to bus. So we start to think in, in alternatives to make people uh, also uh, make people more comfortable in doing this integration, maybe with bicycle. And this is what we are talking here. Uh, also, we did rec recent investments to transform city public transportation system. We have a single fare ticket. It's called Bilhete Único in Brazil, in Fortaleza. It's a time integration system uh, with unlimited transfer uh, up to two hours. Also, we have exclusive lane to bus transportation and BRTs, uh, two main corridors already implemented in the city. Also, we are, rene we are renewing our fleet uh 100 percent with wi-fi also air conditioning that it's really important in our context we are really near the ecuador so we have a hot city in fortaleza if you want people to stay in public transportation that it's a challenge because some of them are uh, migrating to uh motor vehicle especially motorcycles so we want to uh take this as an, an attractive uh mode of transportation. Also, we have a, a bus on demand, uh, flexible routes, and you can ask a vehicle through an app and they he will leave only a uh, 100 meters maximum of the origin and destination. We are reforming our bus terminals, so a lot of uh, actions. Also, this one, uh, we have an app that you can estimate the time of the vehicles were in the bus stop also with a panic button to report harassment because we have uh, uh, the transportation with over capacity. So sometimes we have this kind of incident in public transportation. Um, and well, the public transportation policies are, are central in, in, the, in the city and with strong encouragement with for integration with other modes. So talking a little bit about the complementary of this, uh, the speed and possibility of reaching long distance uh, public transportation associated with the flexibility and efficiencies of the bicycle for short distance 
uh, really can benefit users. So thinking uh, on that, we did a lot of uh, investment in, in cycling uh, policies here in Fortaleza oriented towards integration with the public transportation system. So we expanded a lot our cycling network. We, in 2013, we have 68 kilometers of cycling infrastructure, and now we have 413 kilometers of cycling infrastructure in eight years, more than uh, five times. We, we, we make it this, the cycling infrastructure bigger, and more than 50% of Fortaleza population lives at least uh, 300 meters away from our cycling infrastructure, and it's the high percentage among Brazilian capitals. Uh, this is uh, some of our cycling infrastructure in the city, so you can take a look a little bit of it. Uh, also, we have bicycle parking near the, near the terminals that we have, the integrated terminals, what people can change buses in, in uh, in a uh, special spot that have a lot of converging uh, lines. And it's 24 hours operation and it's free. Also, we have a bike share system. That is, uh, we have two, uh, one, uh, 191 stations and it's on the way to expand our system to 210. And we use public resources and also uh, sponsorship to implement that. And to that, uh, well, one thing that we put uh, that was important to promote the integration was uh, that the system is totally free for users that have public transportation card with the single fare ticket. Uh, Bicicleta also started our system, uh, started near highly demanded stop, uh, bus stop points in the city to stimulate this integration. We also develop a, spe a specific system, uh, which we try this uh, in near the integration terminals. We put like huge stations with bike sharing uh, uh, to integrate with public transport. Also with the same rule of that it's free for who, those who have the, the, the public transport car, but you can spend up to 14 hours with the bicycle so you can take home and come back in the other day and take your bus like to to improve the the first and last mile in the city and well the system is really important also to to reach those that uh, are low income groups that live far, far from central areas in fortaleza and didn't have access to the regular bike share system at the beginning. Now it is already expanded our system. We are already in these areas uh, with our regular bike share system, but at the beginning we didn't have uh, the system in the whole city. So this was a, an important strategy to simulate also this integration. So these are the three main ways that we we try to integrate bicycle with public transportation for Taleza. They're, they are really simple infrastructure like the with own bike, with your own bike, your your particular bike, you can use the uh, the, the parkings uh, spots that you have on the near the terminal of integration. Also, we have our regular bike share system that is now expanded in the city, and you have Bicicleta Integrada that it's uh, that was developed specifically specifically to, to integration. And well, between May and February and May of 2009, uh, I know they are conducting another uh, research. We talk it to the users to understand how they integrated in the city and who integrates in Fortaleza are mostly men uh, up to 35 year old uh, that uh, has scholarship, uh, low scholarship. Also uh, up to three salaries of income. Uh, three salaries, it's around $7,700. Uh, $7 uh, most, uh, most of it employed and without motor vehicle. They don't have a motor vehicle. And the trip characteristics are the, the reason 60% will go to work and 80% cycle up to 4.5 kilometers. And this is a map that we put like the, the domicile, the, well, the residence of these users that integrate. If you can see in this map of Fortaleza, this was the beginning of Bicicleta 
is our system, a bike share system that is started in the central area of the city. But as you can see, uh, people live uh, in the low income areas of the city, 60 to, to uh, 100 of households are low income in this area. So the bicycle was really an important alternative to them. And to promote uh, the use of the bicycles and expand the possibilities, uh, we created a lot of uh, important legislations for continuity of the policy. We, uh, the resources from public parking in the city are exclusively used for bike, bicycle policy in Fortaleza. So uh, we use it to expand uh, our bike share system, also to do not, uh, other cycling infrastructure in the city. Also, all apps in the city, uh, app-based travel like Uber 99, uh, must pay 1% of each trip into a sustainable mobility fund. And this is a little bit of our share system, what is start uh, our bike share system. And now what it is, uh, it goes through routes of transportation, through important routes. And this is a picture of it. Another one. And just to finish, we are remodeling our integrated system, bike share system. Uh, we are now thinking and and how to put manual operation uh, like bike sharing with a container infrastructure like this a little bit. We are trying to redesign it and to I think it's more like the BTB uh, project that uh, my other colleague was telling, we are trying to think a little bit uh, of a project like that. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't pass so many of the time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thais. Yes, and also for like having such a, a visual presentation. I think we were also all hooked by the images. And also, yes, for referring to uh, in this last project. Indeed, it looks very similar to, to the project in St. Boy that uh, the Tolga was presenting. Uh, I will now pass the floor to Arianna for the final uh, Q&A. And if there are questions, we can, I mean, and if that's okay for participants, we can take like five minutes more of everyone's time uh, to go through them. Please, yes. Arianna. So um, anyone that wants to come in uh, with a question, otherwise I have uh, my wide range of uh, questions myself. But uh, it's uh, if there is someone in the audience that uh, would like to ask something, please uh, write in the chat or raise your hand. Um, I will start with uh, one question from uh, Thais. Uh, I saw that there, is the, there was one slide where you mentioned that uh, Uber revenues, 1% uh, of the Uber revenues go into the um, into cycling uh, infrastructure. Uh, how did you manage that? Was that an agreement that you reached with them before allowing them to operate or? Actually, they came first and then we did a law that uh, created this this fund, uh, this mobility fund that sustainable mobility found that this 1% uh, should be to this fund. And actually it was, well, a lot of, uh, conversation in political uh, level, but actually it wasn't so hard to, to implement. Maybe I can share later our law. Mm -hmm. And well, this actually, it's the thing that possible that make possible this expansion to the uh, to our bike share system without sponsorship to areas that are really important in the city, uh, low income areas that sometimes sponsorship don't want to uh, mm. Go. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you also mentioned the, the sponsorship system for the bike sharing system. Uh, is that publicity that is attached to the bikes or how does that work? I think I, th I think it's the same with most cities. They can use part of the bike uh, with a limited area to put their logos. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have this in our bike share system here. Part of the bikes, uh, we actually did a bidding process uh to 210 stations where where we were demanding that at least 80 stations that had sponsorship so the municipality pays for almost half of it and the sponsorship uh choose uh what which area 
it uh, wanna be, but mm. uh, we actually can reach uh, a good part of the city of also low income areas. Great. There is a question for you from the audience. Um, who is paying the Bicicleta Integrada system? Uh, is it the public transport company or the public administration? Uh, actually, it's a pilot initiative, so we did it through sponsorship. Uh, but it's really hard to, man to maintain that with the sponsorship. So we are trying to put to use the the sustainable mobility funds and also the funds from public parking in the mm. city to implement that too as we tested and it worked well uh with some with some adjustments that we know that now we need we want to pay for it the city paying perfect thanks a lot um, so, last chance, if you want to ask uh, a question uh, to Holger or Thais, this is the moment. Otherwise, uh, uh, did we have a final announcement, Eugenia? Uh, not necessarily, but while uh, <laughs> our participants think, I will share again just a slide with the next uh, appointments, so the next webinars. Uh, and you will see, I mean, many of the topics we addressed today actually will also come back uh, in in our uh, planned webinars. So let me just find it because I'm starting from scratch here. Uh, yes, so this is the plan that we have uh, worked on. So we will have our next webinar on urban logistics in September. We will have another one on active mobility where we will look uh, a bit more into, of course, again, cycling, but also uh, working in cities in November, um, then we will have one on electric mobility in February and in March, Samsung and CCAPS integration. Uh, I will also would like to flag that about this topic of SAMS and CCAPS integration, so the integration of sustainable urban mobility plans and sustainable energy and climate action plans. We will have a session in the uh, Urban Mobility Days in September in Brno, Czech Republic, um, together with, uh, with DigiMove, with also examples from Covenant cities. Uh, so we will share more information about that uh, uh, very soon on, on our website. And you can check the Covenant of Mayor's website to know when the next uh, webinars will take place. So I don't see any question that has popped up in the chat uh, while I was making this panel. I think announcement. our speakers yeah. were uh, just so, so you, they went so much in depth <laughs> explaining everything and so everything was covered. <laughs> But so thanks, thanks very much. And also to everybody that uh, joined us. Um, Eugenia, yes. maybe, I don't know if you want to officially close it. Yeah, I will. Uh, so I hope to see you all in our next uh, webinars and we will have uh, more talks also on active mobility in November. So I hope to see you there if you if you are interested in this discussion. Thanks a lot to everyone. And thanks a lot to, to our speakers for being with us from different time zones uh, at the end of this day. Have a nice end of the day. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.